When a group of racist cops decided to pick on me for their night's entertainment, they had no idea they were messing with their new chief. I'm Julian Parker, 54, freshly appointed chief of police, and I returned to my hometown to get a read on the department. I chose not to announce myself, just observing, blending in, and letting my presence be a secret for now. One quiet night, I decided to take a stroll through a rough part of town, dressed casually. That's when I heard it, a mocking voice. Two officers, smirking and arrogant, made me their target. The leader stepped forward, trying to intimidate me, barking orders for me to put my hands up and asking if I thought I could just walk around there. Their eyes lit up as I played along, letting them dig themselves into their own hole. They called in reinforcements, who joined in with taunts and commands, trying to get a rise out of me. They even threw in a few insults about my age, appearance, and the audacity of someone like me walking alone at night. Little did they know they were performing for their new boss. Eventually, they marched me into what they called their interrogation room, laughing and taking turns asking condescending questions. That's when the door opened and in walked Captain Brooks, a longtime friend who instantly recognized me. The room went dead silent. Brooks cleared his throat, saying, We'll address this in tomorrow's meeting. Reality started to sink in for those officers. They realized their night had taken a disastrous turn. The next morning, the department gathered in the conference room. I introduced myself as their new chief, and the room went still. Last night's ringleader, now panicked, stumbled over his words, mumbling about a misunderstanding. But I wasn't letting him off easy. I detailed each disrespectful command, insult, and snide comment, my words striking them like nails sealing their fate. When I finished, I laid out their options. You can either change, respecting this badge and treating people with dignity, or you can find the door. They knew I wasn't bluffing. The message was clear. This was their chance to turn around or walk away. After that intense morning, a heavy silence settled over the precinct. The officers from the previous night, once so full of swagger, now wore haunted expressions. Word spread quickly. There was no escaping the realization that they'd seriously misstepped. The rest of the day was quiet, everyone on their best behavior, and I watched them, giving each officer time to let it all sink in. But my work had only just begun. The next week, I called in the department heads for a private meeting. It was time to assess the culture of this place, and I wasn't about to let it slide into complacency. We discussed accountability, transparency, and respect. I made it clear that a fresh approach was not optional. This department needed to become a true symbol of safety and integrity. To drive the point home, I began a series of unannounced patrols around town. I walked through neighborhoods that had previously been neglected or treated with suspicion, talking to residents, letting people see my face. Slowly, I rebuilt bridges between the department and the community. Some people were hesitant, others were skeptical, but word got around that the new chief was serious about change. Meanwhile, I kept a close eye on the officers involved in that first night's fiasco. I assigned them to community-focused training and made sure they were the first to participate in new sensitivity and anti-bias programs. They would either prove they could adjust or face the consequences of their actions. Then, one afternoon, I received a visit from Tommy, the ringleader of the group that had tried to intimidate me that night. His once cocky demeanor was gone, replaced by a mix of shame and regret. He stammered through an apology, admitting he'd been out of line, that he hadn't understood what it meant to truly serve the people of this town. I listened, letting him speak, but reminded him that actions, not words, would prove his sincerity. Over the next few months, Tommy and the others had no choice but to face the reality of their behavior and take concrete steps toward improvement. Those who couldn't adapt found themselves moving on. It wasn't easy for anyone, but we began to see results. Complaints went down, respect went up, and the department started earning back the trust it had lost. As for me, every day reminded me why I'd come back to this city. I wasn't just here to keep order. 
I was here to rebuild a foundation that had crumbled over time to remind these officers and myself what real service meant. And for the first time in a long while, I saw a future here worth protecting. Months passed, and gradually, I saw the department transform. The officers began showing genuine respect, not only for each other, but for the community they served. Even Tommy, who'd once been at the center of the trouble, was now one of the most active participants in community outreach programs. It wasn't overnight, and it wasn't perfect, but real change was happening. One evening, I was approached by a group of local residents outside a neighborhood meeting. They told me they'd noticed a shift in how officers were treating them. Less intimidation, more listening. One of the older men looked at me and said, You've got people believing in the badge again. Hearing that, I felt a surge of pride. We were on the right track. The following week, I held a ceremony to honor those who had stepped up and committed to the new vision. I made it clear that this wasn't just about medals or public recognition. It was about setting a standard. I wanted the people of this town to see that every officer in that room was someone they could trust. After the ceremony, I watched as officers mingle with the community, laughing and chatting without the usual guarded expressions. They weren't just officers anymore. They were members of the community, protectors, and maybe most importantly, neighbors. Looking back on that first night, I realized that sometimes the hardest part of leading is knowing when to step back and let people reveal their true colors. Those officers had done just that, and I had given them the choice to change or walk away. The ones who stayed did so because they wanted to do better, and in the end, they proved they were worthy of wearing the badge. As I left the ceremony that night, I felt a deep sense of accomplishment. My job was far from over, but for the first time, I knew I'd made a difference. And this time, for the better. This town, my town, finally had a police force it could believe in. And as for me, I was exactly where I needed to be. I'd be glad to help with ideas to encourage subscriptions. Here are a few tips for encouraging viewers to subscribe to your channel. 